go. Hello. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Judy Lynn, for that song. That's a pretty sweet song, very powerful. Thanks. So, uh, if you're here for the first time to First Baptist Church, I'd like to welcome you here. Welcome, and uh, um, hopefully you'll enjoy our worship and our fellowship and the reading of His Word. Um, the message today comes from Isaiah 40, uh, 1 to 5. And the question I want to ask you guys today is uh, what comforts people when everything falls apart? What gets you through hard times? Some people are able to get through hard times because of their kids, their pets their job, all sorts of things can get people through. What what gets us through? What comforts us and what comforts you? As I was thinking about what to preach on, thinking about what we need to hear as a church, the words of the prophet Isaiah was echoing in my head. Comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Recently our hearts have been broken by conflict in our church, by differences of opinion, differences of priorities, and with that many frustrations. I myself have felt really discouraged and a small amount hopeless. I think, oh Lord, Well, I pray this. Oh Lord, what are we going to do now? We could use some comfort as a church. Amen? Amen. Amen. So then let us seek our God and look into his word for our comfort. Because he is the God of all comfort, which is an amazing thing. And his word shows us who he is. Jesus is our comfort even in unraveling times. So I'll just pray over the message. If you can bow your heads with me. Lord, I pray that you would use this sermon, that you would use your word to comfort our hearts. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work powerfully in this message and in the worship today and in our fellowship. I pray that you'd be glorified in this message and that only what is true would be remembered. Um, Please be merciful. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, uh, you can open to Isaiah chapter 40. Um, uh, Thank you, Nabongs, for reading all of Isaiah 40. That was a really good read. Um, I think the word of the Lord is very powerful. We will not be discussing the whole chapter today as a sermon, just the first five verses. Um, Yeah, Mike, I'm hearing myself really loud. Is that? uh, Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, so, comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. I'm reading out of the ESV. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare has ended and that her iniquity is pardoned and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, before we understand this, we need to uh, do some context. So, 
pop quiz, who wrote the book of Isaiah? Isaiah did. Very good. Um, so the book is written by Isaiah, son of Amos, um, between the times of 740 years before Christ and 681 years before Christ. Isaiah was a prophet under the kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. During his ministry, many things happened. First, there was the crisis of the northern kingdom of Israel because Israel was split into two um, earlier in their history and they weren't very good friends after that. Um, the northern kingdom of Israel with their ally, Syria, had rose up to fight against Judah. So they were ganging up on them at the playground. Isaiah reassured Ahaz that God would defend him. But Ahaz did not believe God. Ahaz is the king. And rather got help from the Assyrian nation. The Assyrians delivered them, but then soon occupied the entire land of northern Israel and put to the sword and taking all of it into exile. Um, it's pretty epic history, and it's cool that when we read in the Bible and we see other historical sources, this stuff actually happened. And it's, yeah. So that was the first crisis in the book of Isaiah. And the second crisis, the Assyrians came back. And this time, they wanted to take Hezekiah and they wanted to take Jerusalem. Um, the king, Hezekiah, turned to Egypt for help. Egypt came to help and they were defeated. And so the last ditch effort, they finally um, called out to God. And listen to this. God sent an angel. You can read this in Isaiah 37. And the angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. Um, that's pretty epic. Um, that's, that's a bit of history for everyone who loves history. I know, I know you like history, so there you go. Um, other events that happened during Isaiah's ministry included the healing of Hezekiah from a disease and Hezekiah showing servants from Babylon um, his entire, all the riches of his house. He showed him all of Israel. And then Isaiah said to him, you have showed Babylon all your riches. Babylon is going to come and take all those riches. You shouldn't have shown them around. Um, that is a context with what we're reading today. Um, this is written to the Israelites while they are in exile. And um, yeah. So we'll explore the passage today in two ways. First, we will look at what it meant to its original audience, and then we will look at what it means for us today. So uh, let's read uh, verse 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. God is telling Isaiah in these first few verses, comfort my people. And this is the theme of the entire chapter and the next few chapters is God's desire to comfort his people in different ways. Um, but first, let's ask the question, why do they need comfort? And the answer, like we alluded to before, was because they were exiles in Babylon. It's like if the, if, um, the United States came and, and uh, took you away and took you to Nebraska and just left you there. Um, they were taken because they as a nation refused to worship God. Instead, they turned to idols, um, lesser gods. They did not act justly. They oppressed the poor. The people of God were corrupt and wicked. And because of their wickedness, God sent the Babylonians to judge them. And the Babylonians tore down the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was their hope. That was where God had his temple. And they also burned the temple. And they killed thousands. 
And then whoever was left was taken away to Babylon. I pause here because this is actually, like, that would be incredibly devastating. All of your hope is in Jerusalem, perhaps, and it's just destroyed and burned. And they're taken to exile and they're sitting there. They're in exile and they deserved it. So something in this passage that's kind of interesting is that God calls his people my people. And he speaks comfort and tenderly to them because he should just speak judgefully to them and wrathfully to them for their sin. Um, in the book of Hosea, it says that God has written Israel a certificate of divorce. Where they were his people, he says, you are not my people. And he sent them away to Babylon. But now he says, comfort, comfort my people. And you just feel the Lord's love in it and his mercy. Um, he's the God of uh, second chances. So in recap, we discovered why the people need to be comforted. They're in Babylon. Jerusalem's destroyed. Many of them have died. And we've also discovered why God comforts them and speaks tenderly to them. And it's because he loves them. Even though they do not deserve it, he is the God of second chances, but who still incurs judgment. So that's just a little bit of context. And now, so we've discovered... Let me, let me try to remember. Hopefully you can remember what we discovered. Um, <laughs> we discovered why he's comforting them. And now let's look at, in the next verses, how he comforts them. So he comforts them by saying, cry to her that her warfare, her time of service, is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double from all your sins. So if you're keeping note, for notes first, they are comforted because their warfare has ended. The time of trouble is coming to an end. It's like if you were in the military, it's your time of service is done, soldier. You can retire. If you're in jail, they're coming to pick you up soon. You're free. And that... Their warfare is ending because their iniquity is pardoned, if you read that. So, um, this raises a few questions when I read it. Uh, first one is, uh, why are they paying double for their sins? That's... Um, I think that's a reasonable question. And the second question is really simple. What does iniquity even mean? Um, it's not a word we use very frequently, so usually we just refer to it as sin, but it does have a certain meaning. So let's answer these questions. Why does God judge Israel doubly? God is righteous. He always does what is right. And because he does what is right, he does not let sin go unpunished. Um, just like we appreciate a good justice system that uh, condemns um, uh, people who do wrong and who defends us in that way, so God is also just. Israel receives a double punishment because they were God's people. He had revealed to him who he was. And they were supposed to share him to the nations, but instead they turned to idolatry. And God gave them special blessings. In fact, if they were to obey God, they would receive a double blessing. But because they did not obey God, they got a double punishment. And this was prophesied in Jeremiah sixteen eighteen, and then it happened. So that is why they suffer doubly. Um, and I suppose if you have any questions about this sermon, you can ask somebody or ask me after the service, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, the, their second question, what does iniquity mean? Um, 
we don't really use the word iniquity t today, so I had to look for a definition. Um, we usually say sin with regard to iniquity, and if you have your NIV translation, it actually translates iniquity as sin. It has sin twice in there. But, yeah, iniquity means like crooked, rough. Um, I think as it applies to our own hearts, perverse, uh, perverted. It's like... Um, if I'm a really twisted person, like my parents can give me a gift of something and I could use it against them or something. Like how twisted is that? It's just kind of corrupt. And um, we see iniquity in all of us and how you think of any good gift that God gives us. He gives us wealth. We use it to glorify ourselves. He give us the ability to speak and we curse our neighbor and uh, gossip. Um, we have this imagery of iniquity being pardoned in the next few verses, which is really cool. I had never seen this before. Uh, it's like a voice cries in the wilderness, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare away from the Lord, make straight the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The uneven ground is, is uh, a picture of iniquity. Um, in rough places, a plain. And um, yeah, so yeah, if you had those questions too, that's what iniquity means. That's why they suffer doubly. What? Another question. Just full of questions today. How will God do this? He says your iniquity is pardoned. Um, or how will God comfort his people? He will do this by delivering them out of Babylon. And it says here, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's how he's going to do it. The glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. God is do going to do something, and it is going to be great and powerful. And when he does it, people will glorify him, and they will praise him. And they will say, you are honored, you are holy, you are worthy. Prepare the way for the Lord, it says, because he is coming. He's coming to visit his people. He will show his glory to Babylon, not to Babylon, to the Israelites in Babylon by sending a savior, by sending a, a Messiah, not the Messiah, but a Messiah, which means deliverer. Like Moses, who delivered the people out of Egypt, God will deliver his people by his might. The deliverer that he sends to the people of Israel is none other than Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. He's a Persian king, the king of the Medes, which is incredible how the Bible interacts with history too. Uh, the Lord sends Cyrus and Cyrus comes to Babylon, the great city, and he goes through the water gate and he completely overtakes the city and this big kingdom of Babylon is toppled in one night. Um, it's really cool history. Um, God actually prophesies this through Isaiah. In Isaiah uh, 44, 28, he says, Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purposes. This is God speaking, saying to Jerusalem, she shall be built and the temple, your foundations shall be laid. So God comforts his people with the hope that he will send a deliverer. Um, and so what Cyrus does is he says to the Israelites, you can go home, which is fantastic and more than that he says take all this money with you go rebuild the temple and he says go rebuild the walls and it's like the hopeless situation just flops like right away like 
we're going home. And more than that, we've been provided for. Um, and so the people are comforted. The Israelites are comforted. So, how does this apply to us today, this message? The prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled, and it was fulfilled in Cyrus. But it was not fully fulfilled. It, it was a prophecy that was looking forward to even something greater, something else would come. And we get an allusion to this in our passage today. It says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. And that appears again in the Bible, in the New Testament. It appears in Luke 3. So uh, if you have your Bibles, can you turn to Luke 3? And we will um, kind of read the context that the New Testament um, speaks about this particular verse. So starting in verse 2, During the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance of the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh will see the, it doesn't say glory, it says the salvation of our God, which is his glory. This comfort to God's people is ultimately filled in Jesus Christ. Jesus went about the countryside in Israel, making straight paths smooth. He pardoned iniquity and he forgave sins. This happened all approximately 2,000 years ago. Um, it's actually getting up to we're 22 so pretty much 2,000 years ago um, God sent his son into the world to save the world he did many things on earth he healed people which is good news for you if you are hurting he befriended people which is good news if you're lonely he spoke up against wrong and he did many other things he is the one ultimate deliverer and the ultimate comfort. So how does this apply to us today? Do we need comfort? What is going on? People have left our church over disputable matters. We have non-confidence in our leadership we are lacking lots of positions that could be filled. We have sorrow for our friends who are gone and hurt. More than that, our vision, our vision as a church, our big plans, um, in my heart, they almost seem impossible. I sat in a meeting we had recently and I thought, how are we going to do this? How are we going to keep our church running? How are we going to be Christ's kingdom and glorify his name in this community when we have been cut down so much? It seems impossible. It seems just like back then. The walls have been torn down. The temple is being burned. Where do we find our comfort and where do we find our hope? Our comfort and our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He, as the song we sung recently, He is the light, light, light of the world. A place of darkness is exposed by the light. He is the light. He is the comforter of our souls. 
He takes away our sin. He takes away our guilt. He makes us new. He gives us life. He has promised that he will never leave us. He will supply our every need. These all have uh, verses. I'm just not... Uh, Philippians 4.19, Matthew 28.20. 20. We don't have to fear when trouble comes because he has overcome the world. How comforting is that? He is our sustainer through this hard time. He can give us strength and life. We have this picture in John 15 of Christ as the vine and we as the branches. And if we remain in Christ, we will bear fruit. And I've kind of thought, it seems like we're just this little tiny tree with little twigs sticking out of it, trying to grow, but then a bunch get cut off. But we have not been cut off at the bottom not at the root. If we stay connected to the root, we will continue to have life. He will sustain us. And that is good news. That is great comfort. That our God is still real. That he's true. And he's faithful. More than that, he is our mission and our joy. Um... What do we do now that we are cut? We continue or we start doing what, we've been, what we have been supposed to do this entire time. We are here to worship God. We are here to worship our God, the creator of the universe, who has redeemed us. So that is what we do. We lift up his name and we sing praises. We worship him with our lips and how we live our lives. Second thing we do, we fellowship with one another as believers. Um, we encourage one another when things are rough, and we rejoice with one another when things are good. And third thing we do, we share the good news of Christ to this community and around the world where we've sent our missionaries. We openly declare the truth, and we do what's right. God's kingdom is not shaken or destroyed. In the big picture of things, God's kingdom is not shaken or destroyed. Even if we dissolve in this mini kingdom of First Baptist Church, even if we are destroyed, we, we shall continue to do these things that God has called us to, to worship the Lord, to fellowship, and to preach the good news. We live for the capital K kingdom, the kingdom that Christ is establishing on the earth. We are a small part of that. We live to magnify that kingdom, not lowercase kingdom, First Baptist Church. So even if... Uh, Hopefully I'm not scaring you too much. I think things will probably be fine. But um, uh, even if we perish, um, God's kingdom is ne that we were a part of is never destroyed and will continue. There's a great verse that I found it's from Hebrews 12, 28. And it says... Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And this let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our, our God is a consuming fire. We have so much that we can never lose in Christ. You know, I'll say that again. We have so much in Christ that we can never lose lose despite circumstances in this time we can find comfort and hope and it is all found in Jesus Christ he can and he will fulfill our needs so today let us call out to him and pray to him 
And just like was prayed earlier, let us humble ourselves before the Lord and confess our sin. Because none of us are free from sin. And I feel that at any point, if we get hit with a drought, if we all fall ill, we deserve it. Because we all have sinned. So let us humble ourselves before the Lord and ask for mercy and let's rely on Him in this time. We need His mercy and we need His comfort. Uh, so with that, uh, that's the end of the message. But uh, can we pray together and let's uh, seek our God about this. Lord Jesus, Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all the precious promises that you've given us that will endure. Thank you for having hope in you, having comfort and life. Lord, I pray that you would comfort each of our hearts here today and that you would give us wisdom. Lord, we don't know what to do. I pray that you would uh, bless everybody here, that you can you continue to do your work around the world, and that you would uh, help this church honor and glorify you in all that it does. I pray that you'd bring more people to love you in this community and to worship you. And I pray that we here would be worshipers of you in truth. Thank you, Lord, so much. Thank you that you hear us today. And if this be according to your will, please do it. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.